He said, when was it made? I said, I think this one was made in 2006, but the original is like 1968. And at that point on the screen was the swastika that was, they were dancing in a swastika. And, uh, you know, and the crowd was obviously horrified. And my son looked at me and he said, what did the government say? And I, I said, what? How did, how did the government allow this to be made? In my house, my son, how did the guy, I stopped the movie, excuse me? How did the government allow this to be made? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's really offensive. How did they allow this to happen? The government has no place. He regrets talking to me during a movie sometimes. The government has no place in telling us what we can and cannot say or do. No place. The kind of government that tells you you can't make something, you can't say something, is the kind of government that was run by Adolf Hitler. It's the kind of government that was run by Mao. Kind of government that was run by Pol Pot, Mussolini, Joseph Stalin. Not the kind of government that was run by Abraham Lincoln. It is, unfortunately, the kind of government that was run by Woodrow Wilson, by FDR, by LBJ, by Barack Obama, by Donald Trump. We are not those people. The government does not tell us what we can and cannot say. Here's where we have a problem. Everybody's talking about a safe zone. I need a safe zone. Does speech make you feel unsafe? If it does, then you have been raised poorly if speech can make you feel unsafe. Speech should make you uncomfortable. There's a difference between being uncomfortable and unsafe. Every place should be a safe zone. But is Berkeley a safe zone? If I walk down the streets of Berkeley, just me, am I in a safe zone? I don't think I have to even say anything. I'm not sure it would be safe for me. There's a difference. I can't tell you the last time that I've went to a public function and I felt comfortable. There's a huge difference. One of those things you need to get over. The other is an issue. But those who are crying for safe zones are only making things less safe. Because when you can't shut people up, you have to shut, you have to shove them. First, you try to shut them up. You suggest, then you shove, then you shoot. The only country I feel safe in is a country that didn't blink uh, about that, that cotton vase from Hobby Lobby. It was <laughs> the number one story last week, and uh, there's an update on it. But I, can I just ask you, what matters most? We're being played and we're being torn apart when real issues are happening, when real oppression and struggles are going on. Don't get sucked into the system and go over the cliff with the rest of humanity. More in a minute. 
we're being sucked into things really that don't matter at all. We're being sucked into arguments about uh, free speech and safe zones that, quite honestly, I'm sorry, if you're on a college campus, get over it. There's going to be some communists that are talking to you, and there's going to be some Nazis that are talking to you, and they all have a right to say it. There's going to be some pro-global warming people and some anti-global warming people. You're on a college campus. Get over it. That's where you should be challenged on everything that you think. That's why there is tenure. So somebody can ask outrageous questions. We're not a society that was built on timidity. We have to be able to challenge each other. So Hollywood, college campuses, communists, Nazis, the NFL, you have a right to stand. You have a right to take a knee. Because quite honestly, that's a sideshow. Anybody else feel like you were in the Roman Colosseum this weekend? Real things are happening that actually matter. And we're watching, we're watching lions and Christians. What are we doing? There is free speech. And there's an argument that it is the argument that has to be made that speech must be protected. And the only kind of speech that has to be protected is, is the speech that the majority doesn't like. However, there are people that hide behind free speech, and they do real damage. Right now in Congress, they are talking about the Communications Act uh, and the Communications Decency Act of 1996. And there is is something that came from the Village Voice. It's called the Backpage. And it is the literal auction platform for slavery today. And people have been trying to shut this down for quite some time. And they have some really good attorneys. This needs to be heard by you. There's a movie that is out that just came out. It's on Netflix and iTunes and Vimeo and Google Play, Amazon, DVD. It is called uh, I Am Jane Doe. And it's parents, it's hard to watch. It's parents who sent their kids off to school one day and they didn't come back. Kids that left home and didn't come back until their parents found them being sold on the back page of the Village Voice. It's horrifying. And it's happening. And people are making millions of dollars on it. A woman who didn't know anything about human trafficking just a few years ago is the producer and the director of I Am Jane Doe, and she's with me now, Mary Mazio. Hi, Mary. How are you? Glenn, how are you this morning? Thank you for having me on. Uh, You're welcome. So explain to the audience exactly um, what's happening. So this started, Glenn, when I read an article in the Boston Globe about Jane Doe number one, Jane Doe number two, and Jane Doe number three, age 13, 14, and 15 years old that sued Backpage.com and the Village Voice Empire um, to, for, for compensation for injuries they sustained by virtue of being bought and sold for commercial sex online. And people call this human trafficking and, and sex trafficking and, and sex trafficking of minors. That's kind of a sanitized term, right? What we're talking about is serial child rape. Right. These children are carted from motel room to motel room. They are with the advent of technology. Right. They're scheduled on the hour by the hour. And I had not a clue that this was happening in numbers that would make your head spin in this country. I think like most Americans, I I assume that this was happening in developing countries. Right. Where children are bought and sold for sex. And um, when I read this article, I remember thinking, what the hell? Like, this, this is 10 minutes from where I live, Jane Doe 1, 2, and 3. And they're represented, by the way, by Ropes and Gray, one of sort of the oldest white shoe law firms in the country. And, oh, by the way, how did Ropes and Gray get the case? Like, how did they lose their motion, right? How did they lose this lawsuit? That made no sense to me. 
And as a, I'm a recovering lawyer, which is like highly irritating to most people, by the way. <laughs> but I remember thinking at the time I read the decision and I remember, remember thinking, how is it legal in this country for websites like Backpage? And there are many others, by the way, to host ads selling children. How is that legal? And yet it is. OK, so now is, so people understand um, uh, this is something this is, you know, this comes from the village voice and a lot of people on the left were protecting the village voice and they were like, no, they, they there's no way they understand. There's no way this is happening because to a lot of people on the left, the village voice is, is you know, the voice of a generation and uh, and a, a hero uh, outlet to many. Oh, yeah. Fighting, you know, fighting truth to power. Right. I mean, exposing corruption exposing wrongdoing and yet and listen i'm a i'm a liberal right I, I i swing very left and it pains me right that uh back page and and the village voice and we'll talk about google in a minute um but the dirty little secret to all the alternative weeklies was that their editorial was supported by the sex ads and listen, back in the 70s, it was free love, free sex, right, um, whatever goes. And I think the term, the lexicon around human trafficking, nobody really started talking about it until 10 years ago, 12 years ago. What is it? And I think that really exposed what you said before. This is particularly as it relates to children, modern day slavery. And the numbers are escalating with technology online. And what I mean by that is that um, the problem is getting worse rather than better. There's an estimate of around 15% of all homeless and runaway children um, will be victimized. And when you think about the numbers, there's anywhere between 1.6 and 2.5 million children on the street at any one time. 15% of those children, oh my God, we're not talking about a kid here or there that shows up at the Port Authority. We are talking about, conservatively, hundreds of thousands of children. And by the way, I received this report from the University of Louisville, and they said, Mary, you know, we understand that 15% is sort of the estimate. It's in the shadows. Nobody quite knows. But make no mistake, we, we did a study of children in Kentucky and Indiana. We have concluded that 40% of homeless and runaway children were victimized by by child sex trafficking, four zero percent. So this is a problem that is escalating in size and scale, and it sits alongside the opioid epidemic, and that is something that nobody is talking about because those children are the most vulnerable. Okay, so Mary, I'm going to run out of time, so I would like to because I want to get I want to build this in layers because there's a there's a lot of information that people need to uh, to absorb. First, I want you to watch the video. It's free. It's everywhere. It's I Am Jane Doe. It is a really well-produced documentary. And I, I warn you, it, you, when you start talking about um, freedom of speech, you will, you will, if you're a libertarian, start to say, well, wait a minute. Hang on just a second. Uh, do they have a right? Do, do they have a responsibility to know exactly what's happening on the other side? If somebody is just putting in a classified ad, but that's not what's happening here. Um, you know, if somebody wants to pay, post something on Facebook, Facebook isn't responsible for what everybody says online. They can't be. It'll put them out of business. Nobody can do that. But that's not what's happening. Can you quickly, Mary, explain what the back page is doing? Yeah, and so this is really interesting because a Senate investigation sprang up, which provided all kinds of evidence that, for example, a pimp or a trafficker might post an ad for a child and use terms that would signal a child, new in town, fresh, off the boat, schoolgirl. These are indicia of a child, right? And Backpage developed filters, according to the congressional report, that would automatically scrub the term Lolita or schoolgirl, right, um, or Amber Alert, and yet the ad would then be posted. So there was some conscious decision to mask indicia of a child. And I think that is what is so troubling about the Wild West online is that back, 
Backpage and those that have supported Backpage, which, by the way, includes Google and others that are desperate to keep this Wild West culture online, have said even if you're a website that encourages illegality, you still bear no responsibility for the harm that happens, including the sale of children. Mary, just to clarify, were you saying that they put the term Amber Alert in the ads? Some traffickers apparently put the term Amber Alert because it was a term that the that Congress discovered was filtered out automatically by Backpage. Wow, that is absolutely yeah, I kid you not. unbelievable. I kid you not. So, the child, there was a child, there's a new mother to the cause, and there's an effort in Congress right now to change, to really close the loophole, right? If you're a bad actor and you're encouraging this kind of activity, you ought to bear some responsibility, right? There should be a financial incentive for you to clean up your act. And one of the mothers, her child, she lost her child at Christmas time to a back page buyer. Her, her daughter was 16 years old. What, what did the ad say? Fresh, new in town. I learned this from working with Operation Underground Railroad, um, that there are, you know, low miles, um, you know, th- th- there are yes, terms, uh, there are terms that people who are buying children clearly understand. And um, and for Backpage to be censoring those and then not turning those people into police is, is really uh, uh, quite reprehensible. Uh, and frightening. I want you. Here's what I want you to do, Mary. Would you be willing to come back later this week? And because I, I want to talk to you about the Google connection, because yes, of course, Mary is Mary is uh, you know as uh, as you know. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mary, but you and I don't agree on much. I would imagine. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, exactly. You could probably count it on one hand. Yes. Ben. Okay. So, uh, so we don't agree on we don't agree on much. However, uh, we do agree on this. And what she's going through now, what Google appears to be doing to her, they are making her look like me. They're making her, uh, you know, oh, treating her. Mary, I'm so sorry. Yeah, for no, you. they're treating her like they would treat like they would treat me. So something is really wrong. I get it when they're treating me that way, but when they're treating one of their own, there's something really wrong, and I want her to explain that. But the first thing I want you to do is please today watch uh, I Am Jane Doe and bring yourself up to speed on this because there's something going through Congress that needs to happen. Later this week, I hope to have Mike Lee on to talk. Have you talked to Mike Lee about this at all, Mary? No, I have. No, I have not. Okay, so I, I'd like to get Mike involved in this because I trust Mike as you know a, a, a real strict constitutionalist, but he's also a deeply moral man, um, and so will you know will not excuse uh, will not excuse uh, the uh, the horrors. Uh, done to people over, you know, for 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 rights, if you will. Um, right, exactly. And and he's a First Amendment specialist, and I think both he and I fundamentally agree this is about conduct online and yes. has nothing to do with speech. Nothing to do with speech. Okay, Mary, thank you so much. I appreciate it. the The name of the movie is I Am Jane Doe. We'll talk again, Mary. Thanks. Um, did you hear about the shooting that that um, happened yesterday at the at the church in Tennessee? Uh, terrible horrible and uh, one of the guys goes out to his car and he tries to wrestle the gun away from the, the from the shooter and 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 couldn't get it so he goes out to his car and he gets his gun because he couldn't carry it inside of the the church we don't know what happened we don't know if that's what stopped this shooting or not but i can guarantee you um if it wasn't for tennessee if he was someplace else and had his gun in his glove box, even if it was legal, and he stopped somebody from shooting people, it, it, he would be in trouble. He would be in trouble. Right now, I want you to go to the USCCA and get their home defense checklist plus their new booklet that is out. It's 165 pages long, and it comes with bonus free audio so you can listen to it as an audio book. But it is everything that you really need to know if you carry a gun. Go to protectanddefend.com. It is free now. You get the instant access to that. But it will really show you what you need to know because the kind of stuff that happened in Tennessee could happen to you, unfortunately. Protectanddefend.com. More on the NFL when we come back. Why is everybody talking about the NFL today? There's a really simple answer to this. To get you to stop 
talking about health insurance that will be unaffordable for half of the country next year. This is what's coming your way. The Senate has until the end of the week to stop this from happening. But the Graham Cassidy Hail Mary already looks like it's doomed to failure because of John McCain. Ted Cruz has now come out and said he's against it. Donald Trump now is cozying up to Rand Paul. Let's forget about all the political games for a second. If nothing gets done in the next five days, what happens? Premiums have already soared over the past couple of years. But by 2018, those rates are going to become completely unaffordable. If you live in California, Texas, Florida, or Georgia, you will expect to see a 50% increase in your premium for 2018. Can you afford that? God forbid you live in Wyoming, you have it harder. Your premiums are going up over 80%. Your southern neighbors... They have it even harder. Don't complain, Wyoming. At least you're not living in, in Colorado because their rates are going to hit near 200% higher than last year. It's the same all over con- uh, the country. In Virginia, it's 180% increase. In uh, Indiana, 117. New Mexico, 84. It's on and on and on. This is what's coming. This is why we said when Nancy Pelosi said, well, you're going to have to pass it to know what's in it. We said, don't pass it. The Affordable Care Act deems health insurance unaffordable if it costs exceed 8% of your family's income. With these premium increases, over half of the country will be forced to pay for something that, by the government that they cannot afford. I, I just want you to keep this into perspective. Two things. One, we were promised this system that is now going to put you into a, into a situation that you cannot afford health insurance. It is this system that came from the Democrats and came from Washington. This is the system that they promised you would save you $2,500 a month and you'd be able to keep your own doctor. Did that work? The answer is no. Clearly, no. Now, they're going to make this all about the Republicans not doing anything. But what do you think the Republicans can do with a government system that's going to make it better? Why would we look to the people who created this problem to fix this problem? Let me ask you this question. Do you think any of us would have flat screen TVs today if 10 years ago the government would have come up with an affordable flat screen act? This is political theater, and the games are playing out in Washington, D.C. this week. The second thing I want you to know is this. This is why those on the left and those on the right are stirring up the hatred and getting us to argue about a stupid football game. We are watching a show. At least that was about sports. I don't know what this is about. I mean, sure, a few people got eaten by lions, but <laughs> at least it was a sport. I don't know if that's technically a sport. <laughs> well, I mean, it's well, you're I, fighting off the lions. Yeah. I feel like it's kind of but sports what was related. That? that was all to distract the people from what was going on. Give them cakes and circuses. This is what's happening. We are involved in a circus. You're being played, America. You're being played by the left and the right. And how do I know that? Because I want you to hear what Mike Tomlin's, uh, Tomlin, yeah. T- Tomlin said mm-hmm. uh, from the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Listen to, listen to his actual quote. We're not going to play politics with football players, with football coaches. Uh, we're not participating in the anthem today. Not to be disrespectful to the anthem to remove ourselves from this circumstance. People shouldn't have to choose. If a guy wants to go about his normal business and participate in the anthem, he shouldn't be forced to choose sides. If a guy feels a need to do something, he shouldn't be separated from his teammate who chooses not to. Uh, So we're not participating today. That's our decision. Uh, We're going to be 100% 
We came here to play a football game. Uh, that's our intention. What did he say? What did he just say, Stu? I mean, he said, essentially outlined the idea that I don't want to make this about some sideshow about the flag when this is a sporting event. We're here to, to play football. And I don't want people who want to take a stand on either side to feel the need to do something. This should be, you know, this is not what it's about. And I'm not here to disrespect the flag. I'm here to, uh, we're here to, to play a football game. So how was he portrayed yesterday? He was, I mean, it, again, like I, all the reporting I heard initially was, because there's a lot of teams who had people um, taking knees. I believe coming into this week, before Trump said anything. It was over. It was seven, it was, yeah, there were seven teams that had someone on the team doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a very small percentage. Um, now they're locked arms. Now everyone, everyone was locked arms or they, you know, uh, or a bunch of them teams were sitting. There were people stretching on the sidelines as the national anthem was, was playing. Um, and a couple of teams decided not even to come out of the locker room. And it was presented as if here is the ultimate stand. They're not even going to show up for the national anthem this time. It's the ultimate stand against the anthem. And in reality, when you hear Tomlin's comments, that's not what he was doing. I mean, he was obviously, when you hear his words, you realize he was not uh, saying, taking a huge stand against the anthem at all. He was just wanting to pull that part of the, trying to eliminate his team from the controversy. Now, he was unsuccessful in that, unfortunately, because a lot of the media reporting. Exactly right. Because of the media reporting. Because the media wanted a side. Because the media, and quite honestly, because people on Facebook and Twitter and everything else, we're all part of the media now, gang. Because we'll see a headline, and because it feels good and it gives us dopamine to choose a side. I'm for this or I'm for that. Somebody saying, I'm not playing this game. There is no way to win. Somebody who says that is going to get slaughtered by both sides. Apparently, there's been some progress made behind the scenes. I don't know what it is, uh, but hopefully Mike will be on with us tomorrow. But I wanted to give uh, Dave Lopez a chance. And and Dave, you're going to get to, uh, you'll get to know here probably in the next few weeks uh, because there's a a really amazing story happening behind the scenes um, and has been going on for quite some time. And it is, I have been following this. I've been following, I don't know anything at all about sports, but I've been following Mike Tomlin uh, behind the scenes because I know what he's, who he is as a man and what he's trying to do behind the scenes, what he's been preparing for. And uh, one of his, uh, one of his friends is on the phone with us now who spoke with him a couple of times uh, over the weekend. Dave, how are you? Dave Lopez, welcome to the program. How's it going, Glenn? Thank you for having me. You bet. So when you when you spoke to Mike uh, this weekend, uh, did he did, did you get the impression that he saw this controversy coming? Far as him saying, "I'm gonna I'm not gonna pick a side," and it turning around and getting more ugly on him. I yeah, that's that's, that's exactly what I saw. Um, I think a lot of this was a uh, last minute decision um, that was, a bit, you know, we all kind of know by now that what prompted this was really not as much the Black Lives Matter movement, but the, the comments, is it, which is what caused this, this different kind of reaction. And so this was a split second, really, decision. But I will say that um, Coach Tomlin has been, has, has, from the beginning, he's, he's, he knows exactly the, the potential for what's going right now and the ability for things to divide people and uh he is very very aware of that and willing to do anything to preserve uh so this would explain it it is and i I wish he were on to speak for himself and and i don't want to i don't want to put words into his mouth and i don't want you to put words in his mouth um but i i do want to lay the some foundation here sure this this explains uh, what he was trying to do yesterday and why he was upset at the one player that did come out and came out of the tunnel because he was looking for 100% compliance. He's like, we are not going to divide ourselves. We're not going to get involved. 
That's exactly right. It was meant to be a, a team statement, and, I, and Al, Al uh, Villanueva is an awesome guy, and, and I think everyone understands why he did what he did uh, in the end. Right, and, uh, Mike, and Mike understands that too, correct? Oh, absolutely. absolutely, 100%. So, um, uh, you, you've gotten to know him and, and I want to tell your story and his at a later date, I want to talk to him first, but can you, can you give people an insight uh, at all on Mike not being just some face in the crowd? He has a, a pretty remarkable story, especially when it comes to race. Yeah, he he has a he has his own uh, very very unique story, and 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 I kind of have a, a differing kind of like the polar opposite story, but really the same thing from my perspective. And um, I really, uh, in a nutshell, you know, he he understands why uh, men are growing up with these kind of feelings towards law enforcement. And I think when he gets to tell that story about himself and what he came up through, it'll be very evident as to why. He is doing what he's doing, and there's much more to it than what people are reading into it. But I know, I know, 100 that's going to be seen in time. Right, and it's not that he has. I mean, he understands both sides because if for the for the listening audience, if you remen, remember Ken Hutcherson, um, Hutch was a guy who, before he died of cancer, I thought was the great uniter uh, that we had been looking for. He had grown up really, really. Um, you know, a black supremacist. He liked uh, Malcolm X, and he did not like white people um, because of what he grew up with. Uh, and then he he found God, quite honestly, and completely he he flipped entirely, uh, and so could speak to both sides in a complete and unique way. Is is this kind of Mike's story? I believe that is exactly the kind of person he is, and I think he's uniquely qualified for it. That's just my assessment of it. I, I will say I've spent a lot of time with him, especially over the last six months, and I, I've i met fewer people, especially in his position, um, that are as committed to using the platform that he has for good, um, whether it's his, the organization uh, Man Up Pittsburgh, uh, where he's constantly rallying men in the inner cities, to stand up and take ownership of their lives and their families. Um, he is constantly working a lot of times behind the scenes uh, to make these things happen. Um, he's also extremely smart. He knows the way things divide people. And I've, I've heard him, you know, I've heard him say things, even to players like, Hey, he, he's not the kind of guy that thinks the right response is I'm going to make sure to tell every person what they should or shouldn't do. That isn't at all how he thinks you get success, and I actually agree with him. But he is the kind of person that's going to challenge a man. And if he says, hey, look, if you're going to take some stand for something, it better not be something you just do in this one time window. It better be something you're really about. Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, don't be led by the nose by people. That is his message that he's been saying for, for years now. To his players. That's the same exact message that from the uh, Eagles owner, Jeffrey Lurie. Um, of course, the Eagles obviously yesterday beat the New York Giants on a 61-yard field goal. <laughs> just wanted to point that out to the audience who may not have picked that up. Yeah, thank you, Stu. I appreciate it. Dave, um, uh, we will be talking to you again hopefully in the next few days, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have Mike on tomorrow to give us uh, his uh, story. But I urge you as Americans to not pick sides i urge you especially before you have all of the information uh, i don't know if i'd be burning your uh, your steelers jersey uh there's much more to this story and when you hear it i think you will regret setting that up yeah glenn i just wanted you to know i, I listen to you i respect your show i've Thank listened you, to it ever since you started but i'm just real disappointed in the nfl and the stance that that was like mike tomlin took uh, on this deal, I feel like this, that it was political, but I also feel like this whole situation is running sports for everybody. Okay, so it's hang on, let, let's uh, hang, on, hang on. Let's take a couple of things here uh, separately. I agree with you. I think this whole thing is ruining sports. It's we're allowing politics to permeate everything in our life, and it is wrecking everything in our life. 
I agree 100%. I don't like the stance of the NFL. The NFL, if they wanted, if the NFL wanted to stop something, the NFL stops things. I mean, they stopped people from, you know, doing a little dance in the end zone, didn't they? They, they came down hard on that. So if they wanted to stop something, they could stop something. They don't want to. Uh, don't agree with the stance. Uh, three, when it comes to Tomlin, what makes you say, I mean, I have it from the horse's mouth. I wish he was on today, but he couldn't. He'll hopefully be on tomorrow. But I have it from him. It's not political. It's not political with him. So where, what are you, what are you disagreeing with Tomlin on? Well, how could it be not political? Everybody goes out there and they stand for the national anthem. Well, now they don't. Some of them are even stretching. They're not even taking a knee. They're not even taking a knee in protest. They're, they're laying on the field and they're stretching. He says we're not going to take the team out there. But I think we're the, not going to be a part of this. Okay. And I think the argument, though, is if you, if you go out there, they're going to take stands. Some of the players are. And then you are going to be making a political stand. He's trying to remove that from the equation. In different ways. Think about things that make us uncomfortable and make us squirm a little bit. There is no such thing as a safe zone except for the United States of America. Every place in America should be a safe zone. You should be physically safe to be able to express your opinion. But that does not mean that you're going to be left uh, uh, to be comfortable. The only time I've ever grown is when I'm uncomfortable. You're going to be uncomfortable in life. That you don't have a right to, uh, to ask for. To be safe... In my point of view, to not have somebody kill me for it. Yeah, I'd like that. I think that was the first one. I have a right to life. Yes, that's what it was. So let's look for perspective on the national anthem. I want to make this really super clear. Uh, I, 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 I mean, I, have, I don't have a dog in the fight because I can walk away from the NFL and never watch them again because I don't care. I, I'm not a sports fan, so I don't care. And I think what's happening in the NFL is disgrace. It's just a disgrace. And I think it's a continuation of what is happening with uh, ESPN. They've chosen sides. They don't care. And they're just going to continue to do what they want, thinking that you're trapped watching ESPN or watching football, and you're never going to give it up, so they'll just do whatever they want to do um, because they have a different agenda. That's what I believe. Could be right, could be wrong. That's my personal opinion. It is easier for me to talk about this because, again, I don't have a dog in the fight. I don't, I don't care. I can turn it off, and it doesn't impact my life at all. Now, because I don't care, and because I'm not sharing this with, with my son, I'm not sitting there watching it and seeing those guys and then having to look at my son and say, okay, this is wrong, and having to explain that. When I don't want to have that time taken with my son, I want to share it with just a game. So I understand that. So take everything that I say with the understanding that I don't share that with you. But I want to give you perspective. I want you to make a list in your own mind right now of what things actually affect you. What actually affects you? The healthcare debate? I don't know if you missed at the top of the hour we talked about Colorado is you're going to have a 200% increase in your healthcare costs next year if Congress doesn't act in the next 5 days. 200% increase. Now, we can argue about whose fault that is. Is that Congress? Is that the Republicans? Or is the, Because this is Obamacare. This is what we told you would happen. But doesn't matter. That is going to affect your life. And it's about 100%. It's between 60 and uh, I think 250% increase is the highest in the country. But you're going to get at least a 60% increase in your insurance. Can you afford that? That actually affects your life. How about what's happening in your school right now? That actually affects your life. How about the cost of an education, which has gone up 41% since Obamacare was put in? Why, why, why is education going up 41%? Why are we accepting that? Why is no one talking about that? 
what's happening on co- campus where our kids are learning garbage that actually affects your life Somebody who doesn't stand for the national anthem, where is that on that ranking? Now, I can make the case that not standing for the national anthem changes our culture, and it does impact my life. I can make the case that getting rid of the national anthem at the top is, is going to affect my life because it changes our culture. But before, because I don't even need to make that case, so I don't even need to say before I make that case. You've already made that case. You know that. Before you go down that road entirely, I want to talk to you a little bit about nationalism. Nationalism is, is uh, I would contend, the thing that has gotten us in trouble. It is a progressive idea. Started around the turn of the century with Teddy Roosevelt. And if, if I may just ask you to go here, divorce yourself from everything and everybody today. Let's just go into the world of thought and academia here for a second, and let's just think things through. What has been the biggest cause of problems in the Middle East in the last 100 years? I would say there's a few things. Nazism coming in and planting the seeds of anti-Semitism is a big one. Uh, the idea of oil being something that the United States would need to buy from the so from the uh, Saudis and from the Middle East instead of getting it ourselves, because we were trying to stabilize the region. And the third thing is just us trying to stabilize stabilize the region. It was you know comes from uh, you know. You can go all the way back into the early teens of last century, and you can you can look at the packs where the the West said we're going to divide this up and we're going to make these countries, and we're just going to draw the borders. Sykes Pico. So so if you look at the if you look at the three, you have Germans planting just a poison in the Islamic world, and then the other two. Us, saying we know better. And we're going to get involved. That's a new thing. And that comes from this idea that we're going to move democracy. The world, uh, freedom is on the march. Democracy is on the march. And we're going to change the world. That's a whole different idea than we had in the 1800s and 1700s. We were a humble people. It's why we got the Statue of Liberty. France gave that to us, not as a gift they didn't care about us. They gave that, they built that because they were trying to teach the people in Paris that communism is a bad thing, that people having a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of their own, uh, their own happiness, that's a grand idea. They were trying to convince their own people. That's why they built the Statue of Liberty. The same thing with the... Uh, with the George Washington crossing the Delaware. That painting was painted in Germany by a German trying to convince the Germans, don't listen to Karl Marx. He's wrong. He's wrong. Look to America. They have the answer. That's why everybody thinks the original is sitting in Manhattan at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It wasn't. It was burned in the, in the Allied bombing when we were bombing Germany. That's the original. nationalism is something that came in from the progressives to raw raw we're number one we didn't have a standardized flag you know the flag that we can't allow to touch the ground we have to burn it if it touches the ground the the flag wasn't even standardized until Woodrow Wilson meaning you could arrange the stars any way you want. But Woodrow Wilson knew to really truly control people, you had to force them into a group. And so he standardized the flag. It's progress, you know. I want to play. Could you please rise for the national anthem? It's awful. It's awful. But that was our Star Spangled Banner until 1931. Now we treat the Star Spangled Banner and the flag, which was not standardized until the progressive nationalist movement 
the same movement that in the 19, early 1900s were putting Germans and Italians in jail because they would speak German or Italian. Look it up. The same national progressive government that in the 1940s locked up the Japanese and put them in internment camps. You see, we were played back then. We were played on our emotions. Our founders, and in the 1800s, we, we knew a little better. Our founders knew a lot better. Those trappings are meaningless. It's how we act. It's how we treat each other. It's how we live our life. Do we live the principles of America? And here's the saddest thing. What are we doing? We are arguing right now against someone's freedom to protest. It's in the First Amendment. They have a right to protest. We should be standing up and saying, yep, he's a dummy. Yep, he doesn't get it, but whatever. He has a right to do that. That's what we should be teaching our children, that he has a right to do that. At the same time, we're saying that Antifa has taken things too far and they're ratcheting it up with hatred and they're burning things down to the ground. We need to be saying, but they have a right to speak. Not to throw Molotov cocktails, but you have a right to speak. You have a right to be heard if somebody wants to listen to you. We have to separate the player's right to do what they want to do and the NFL's right to make money or lose money the way they want to do. They have to be populist. They have to do the popular thing or they'll go broke. But everybody else has a freedom of conscience. I just, I I just, I, I beg you to take pause. Take the emotion out of it. There is no one that loves this country more than me. There's no one that feels stronger about our troops than me. You and I agree on this. Let's honor our troops. Let's honor the people who fought and died for this country. But here's an idea. Instead of doing it at a football game, let's tell Congress to fix the VA. Because that is something that actually matters and will actually change our life. Uh, coming up in uh, just a second. Also, um, we're going to do something uh, a little different. We're going to we're going to add uh, an extra broadcast to our busy day uh, for a few days this week as we're working on a couple of different things. We're going to uh, we're going to do a live uh, broadcast on Facebook Live. Is it? Will it be at Glenn Beck's Facebook page or just the Blaze Facebook page? Do you know or both? Uh, I think it'll be at both. I'll okay. share it to uh, Stu Bergier's Facebook page. I will share that as well. Wow, it's going to be, it's going to take over. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that'll be uh, in the 12 to 1 o'clock hour Eastern time uh, every day uh, this week. And you can join us only on Facebook Live just this week. We have some stuff too about uh, breaking news on the uh, tax rates that are going to be coming out here from the. Uh... It's thinking big. It's, it's thinking big. Yeah, it's thinking um, it's big. It's not quite what you what it was. Uh, well, I mean, you know, he, he said, you know, we're going to get the top tax rate down. Uh, and uh, he's going from 39. And he's hoping we're starting at uh, a decrease uh, to 35% for the top. Corporate. 39 to 35 is, I guess, the 39. beginning negotiation point. Yeah. So if yeah. you start there, we could see 39 go all the way to 44 or 45%. <laughs> it probably will happen. <laughs> it probably will. Uh, we'll have more on that and your phone calls coming up. They say that the Second Amendment is about guns. Well, the, no, it's not. The Second Amendment is actually about my right to defend myself. That's what the Second Amendment is about. But the reason why people become so passionate about it is because my my growing up on the farm with my grandfather during the summer months ended every night 
with my grandfather and I walking what he called the back 40. And I would try to keep up with his long legs as he had a shotgun opened up, carrying it, and once in a while, between the, the, um, the rows of raspberries, a pheasant would fly up, and he would shoot it, and I'd carry it home to Grandma. The gun doesn't mean, to me, the gun doesn't mean protection. The gun is a representation of my grandfather. And those simpler times, the gun isn't about safety the way some people look at a gun as safety. It is a warm blanket of comfort, the safety of my traditions and the safety of my grandfather and knowing where I came from. That's probably the closest I can get with the NFL. What we're sensing here is a is a loss again of our culture and a loss of something that has real meaning to some of us. I'm somebody who goes to a sporting event or any event and they sing the national anthem. And even though I, 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 a, I, a, I hate the national anthem, I hate this song. It's just a, it's just not, why, why can't we have, I mean, I know this is, this is just me speaking out loud musically. Have you ever heard the Soviet national anthem? It is stirring. It is really good. It's oh, really good. That Ivan Drago was standing for in Rocky <laughs> yeah, Four. That's yeah, how everyone knows that It's really song. good. It's really good. So I'm not a fan of our national anthem. I think there are better songs that we could have chosen as a national anthem, but it's ours, and so I am for it. But you're a fan of the nation. I'm for a, which it a stands, fan of the nation right? for which it stands, and I still, even feeling the way I do about the national anthem, just musically and lyrics... It's not my favorite, but I still cry. I still stand in the stand. I have a lump in my throat every time. I feel like a big crybaby because I always get a lump in my throat. Why? Because of what it says we should yearn to be. America is not a place, it's not a time. It's not a people, it's an idea. And the same thing, that's what the national anthem to me embodies. Even though none of the words say that, that's what I feel. And if I had gone to sporting events with my father, and I know my father used to stand up and he used to do what I do to my son, poke him in the back, stand up. Put your hand on your, in your heart. What are you doing? Stand up straight. Pay attention. Stop talking. Show some respect. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's part of my culture too. We can make this about the troops, and we can make this about a lot of things, and it is about all of those things, but it is also a sense of a loss of culture. Somebody said yesterday, why don't you just stop singing the national anthem? Just They're there to play football. Just stop. That's a loss of something significant. That's a loss of the unity of all of us coming together, 80,000 of us standing in a place, and none of us agree on everything. In fact, you could find whole sections that want to have a fist fight with another, if you've been to Philadelphia, with another section of the stadium. And yet, for a moment, we all unite. That's the loss that you're sensing. That's why this is so personal. I'm not the only guy to figure that out. 
people who want power, people who have an agenda, know that as well. People that want to pull down the country, people that want to see us divided, people that want misdirection, they know that as well. And they're playing you. They're taking something so sacred. Why are you mad at the GOP? I don't know if I can speak for you, but let me speak for me. Because I'm not playing a game. Because I actually believe these things. I believe America has done a lot of really crappy things. But I believe America is still the best in the world. The minute somebody comes up with a better system, I'm there. But this is the best we got. And America did change the world. The idea of America changed everything. And we're about to throw all of that away. And I supported the GOP as much as I ever could. I supported politicians. I spent my time, my energy, my money. I campaigned. I talked to friends. I lost friends. I argued with neighbors and family members. I've been called names. I've been made into something that I'm not because I stood where I stood. You've done the same thing. And I'm guessing that you're mad at the GOP the same reason I am. They didn't mean it. When they said they were against universal health care, it's obvious they weren't. When they say they were for smaller spending and a smaller government, it's clear they weren't. They used us. And they took something that really, truly meant something to us. They took the country itself and wrapped themselves in all of the trappings and because those trappings, we have given those images power, it worked on us. Fool me once. Shame on you. But both sides are doing it again. Fool me twice. Shame on us. Facebook Live today. It'll probably start about 12, I don't know, 15 or so. Uh, Eastern time, and uh, we'll run probably an extra 40 minutes or so. Can you get Facebook in prison? Are you allowed to? Uh, you know? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Depending on who you are. Why? Well, I wanted to see if Anthony Weiner might want to uh, watch yeah. the Facebook Live broadcast today. Don't think he's going to get access to the internet. No? I have a feeling. <laughs> that <laughs> might be a bad thing. That might be a bad thing. Yeah. Maybe even after thing. he gets released from prison, he, he might, might not have uh, access yeah, to the yeah, internet. Yeah. Uh, Anthony Weiner uh, now sentenced to 21 months in prison. Should have gotten more than that. Uh, I, you're probably right on that. He's also paying a $10,000 fine and going through a sex offender treatment program uh, for his uh, sexting with a 15-year-old girl. Uh, and that's just obviously one of the shady uh, things he's done yeah, over he's the not, years. It's not, just, it's, just, it's not just sexting. What he did with that 15-year-old girl is really despicable. I mean, she said, I'm 15. And he said, all oh, the things I would like to do to you when you're 18. And then he said, I want you to do these things to yourself. And really? I mean, he, I mean, it's a 15 year old girl. He knew it. Yeah, he knew it. How he only got two years is is beyond me. It's beyond me. But what an amazing uh, turn of events for this guy. I mean, if you don't remember, if you haven't been listening to the show for a long time or your your memory is as fi- you know, fuzzy as mine is, <laughs> uh, Anthony Weiner was leading the charge against this show in 2010, trying to get Glenn thrown in prison. Yeah. Um, because he didn't like one yeah. of our sponsors. He and said, he, he, he said, we should all go to jail. Nah, things have changed. They really have. Yeah. I mean, and, and I, it's, you know, it's weird. Remember Anthony Weiner was the guy I came to and he said, don't strike back at him. He's not an enemy of ours. He's an enemy of God's. Remember? Mm-hmm. And we're like, well, I don't know if we're necessarily. And I remember saying, no, I'm not saying that God's going to exact revenge for us. No, but there's something that he's an he's a bad guy and let god handle this one 
And he has. It was insane watching it because, you know, being on the inside of these things, you get to see it from a different perspective. And we knew the things he was, was saying were completely untrue. We knew he was lying throughout this process. But, you know, he gets picked up. He gets put on TV. Uh, he, you know, he was still tied in even after leaving office, almost won the mayoralship of New York, if not for a scandal, probably would have. Oh, yeah. A, an additional sex scandal. Yep. Then all of these messages he's been trading happen to be on the same computer where messages from Hillary Clinton are stored which leads to the Comey letter 12 days before the election, which there's really strong arguments that that may have been the thing that tipped Donald Trump over the yeah, top. You really want to I mean, know why you want to know why Hillary Clinton didn't win. One of the things that the left will never talk about is him. Yeah. It's Anthony Weiner. When they say the Comey letter, they like to put the blame on Comey. The blame for that goes to Anthony Weiner. If he wasn't sexting a 15 year old, that never would have come out. It never would have happened. And of course it wouldn't have been effective if Hillary was also, wasn't also you know, incredibly corrupt. If she was clean the whole time and this thing came out, probably not enough to push Correct. him over the top. But with with the built-in belief that she was already corrupt. And it being on Uma's, you know, hard drive, Anthony's hard drive, mm-hmm. those two you knew were corrupt themselves. Oh, yeah. And the whole thing, the whole thing fell apart. It is him. Um, uh, but we're talking here about uh, uh, politics and, and football. Oh, I love it. You know, and... and <laughs> At first, it was kind of cute, wasn't it? Okay, these guys making $12 million a year protesting social injustice. <laughs> Isn't that precious? It's adorable, even. <laughs> uh, all of these guys are multi, multi-millionaires. What kind of social injustice led you to that job? Aren't they proof positive that if you apply yourself in this country and work really hard, you can make it? You can get out of the slums. You can get out of the ghettos. And, and most of these guys have. And because they don't come from wealth, they created their own. And so the hypocrisy of this and the double and the the, well, the inequality of things. Well, if you really cared, if you really truly cared, I'm sorry, but I'm a fan of Washington. If you cared, deeds, Mm -hmm. not words. And I'm having a hard time talking about your hearing you talk about your struggles over the sound of that V12 Bentley (laughs) behind you. I'm I'm sorry, but the engine is a little. Is just a little much to be able to hear. I'm sorry, you were talking about what was Injustice? it? And we come to sports for a respite. It's like an oasis, isn't it? On the weekend, we we have politics all week. We're slapped in the face with it every single day. We we don't want this thrown into our face during a football game, too. We've come there, and some of these guys, some of these people, have paid 500 bucks a ticket to be in the stands or more. Uh, if if you get nice seats, if you get luxury boxes. Uh, you've paid thousands of dollars to attend this game, and then you get to put up with the social justice protest too. I just, and let's not forget Colin Kaepernick, who started all of this, and everybody keeps going back to him and and his right to protest. He didn't quietly, reverently just take a knee. The guy came to games with socks that had pigs in police hats. He showed up at a press conference in a Fidel Castro T-shirt. I mean. Your zero credibility just went to about negative 1,000 credibility. <laughs> Pathetic. And through it all, the sports writers were casting him as a hero. They oh, isn't are. this wonderful? I, I will t- No, it's not. I will tell you that I think Donald Trump has made this worse. I think he has. He has. He has made Colin Kaepernick now is going to be a social justice hero. He was about out the door as a laughingstock. And I think Donald Trump's statements over the weekend have reignited this, mm-hmm. and he's going to be remembered now as, you know, a Che, yeah. a great a great hero. It's a little silly, too, because he had extended the, the offer, the invite, to the Warriors to come to the White House because they won the NBA championship. And then Steph Curry decides, yeah, I'm not going to go in protest. And then he's like, well, okay, then you're not invited. That's like baking somebody a cake. And then they say, I don't want your stupid cake. Well, I'm going to unbake it then. <laughs> doesn't work that way, Donald. No, 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 it doesn't. <laughs> Sorry, doesn't work that way. But I loved the Tom Brady statement uh, yesterday because he's supposedly a friend of Trump. And it, uh, here's, here's his thing. It was I thought it was just divisive. Like I said, I just want to support my teammates. I believe in bringing people together and respect and love and trust. Oh, wait, and cheating... 
I believe in a really good deal of cheating too. Well, so you have a dash uh, of cheating in every in every belief yes. system, I think. Okay, so now hang on just a second. <laughs> hang on just a sec. So you are in you're on a football team. <laughs> yes. And the the deal is we need each other. If we're going to win, we, we need hang each other, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So if I if I go in and I say anything divisive, I'm going to make sure that we've just lost. So I know that I can't change some people's minds. They're never going to take a knee. And I can't change some people's minds. They're never going to stand. For the team, for what you're all being paid to pay, to pay for those cars and those houses and the extravagant lifestyles and the girlfriends that will leave you the minute the money stops rolling <laughs> in, um, to pay for all of that, you have to make a choice. I can either take a stand that will divide the team Mm -hmm. or I could leave the team or I could just say, you know what? We're here to play football and I understand their point of view. I understand their point of view. We're here to play football. Isn't that really the right stance? Yes. Yes. So then why is not the stance he took, but that's the right. stance. So why is Mike Tomlin getting so much heat? Because that's what he did. He just kept everybody out of the madness. He said, I can't, can, I can't convince. I need 100%. And this is why he was mad at, what's his, what's his guy's name? Uh, Villanueva. Villanueva. I, 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 and he, I can't say that. Alejandro mad Villanueva. Yeah, I don't yeah, went out that's... and put his hand over his heart. Right. And, and he stood. wasn't mad at him. It was he just. He made one little comment that basically said, like, he, he said, well, we were, he didn't even say his name. He just said, you know, look, we were looking for 100%. And yeah. I guess, the, you know, the story uh, lines it up is that the team took a vote whether they would all uh, just lock arms or they would all stay in the locker room. And the team voted, 100% of us will stay, or not come out, stay in the locker room. Um, so Villanueva really didn't come out on the field. He just took a few steps outside of the tunnel um, with his head on his heart. And you can see inside the tunnel, a lot of the, the Steelers the players stand are standing there with their hand on their heart yeah. inside mm. the tunnel, but they had agreed as a team. And and so I under, you know I understand that from both perspectives. First of all, Villanueva is a military hero, and, and yeah. he can honestly do whatever the star. hell he wants. Okay, so He's wait, got wait, a wait, bronze wait. star. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so hang on just a second. I think that's great, and yeah. I, I 100% approve, and I like him. I mean, I don't yeah. know anything about him, but I liked that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also like Tomlin's approach, which is everybody stay off the field. We yeah. are not going to get dragged in and go over the cliff with everybody else. Stay off the field. That's smart. Let's go play. Um, didn't so, work. It didn't work. I don't think. Well, really, could it after everything that was going on? I mean, I don't know how any of these guys played with the distractions of. I mean, how is how is Mike? going to be playing did you see that's why the owners are so ridiculous in all of this so stupid they should be insisting so that we, let's stupid. focus on football how about we Jeez. win yeah how would i mean they're even starting to lose me i didn't watch a single game yesterday i mean part of that was i was i was coming back from houston but i could have turned it on and i could have taped it and i could have but i'm just not as interested as i was i'm just tired they're of killing it. themselves i think so they're killing themselves the ratings uh, have come out overnight not a big change um they're down uh, one was down one percent i think um, i don't think that it's necessarily the ratings i think it is you know the, the, they make a lot of money on the t-shirts yeah, the, and the, the logos and the merchandise. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I mean, after a while, you can only beat a brand so much before it's just like there's nothing left. Even the NFL, and I mean, it would take a long time, but they've got so many issues right now. They got the CTE thing, yeah, but- where they just found out that Aaron Hernandez had it too. Uh, he was in stage three or even maybe four of the CTE uh, brain disease, and so how much of his problems were caused by that? I don't know, but they're being sued by his family and ex and, and fiance. And then once that happens, aren't the other 111 out of 112 people who've been who tested positive after their death for CTE? They're going to come after the NFL too. Maybe they should focus on something else. Yeah, I mean, maybe they put a stop to this madness and say, "Look, uh, we've got some other issues here that we need to deal with." So here's the problem. Um, because the, the America does not understand nuance anymore. <laughs> I mean, nobody wants no. to talk nuance. Nobody wants to mm-hmm. have a conversation. For instance, I completely support Colin Kaepernick's uh, right to be an idiot. 
Mm-hmm. And I think he yes. is. An, I think he's an idiot. Yes. I think he's a dishonest. No, that's confirmed. Idiot. Yeah, a, it's worse yeah. than an idiot. But yes, yeah. you're right. Yeah. I mean, I can't call him a Marxist, but f- you know, from what little I've seen with the, you know, he's the Fidel got all Castro the, stuff. Yeah, to believe. He's got all the, you know, he's got all the 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 outward signs of being somebody who is not a friend to freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I know he is an idiot, and he has a right to protest. He has a right to protest on the side of the field and to, until the owner says or the nfl stop doing that right and they're not saying that right yeah because right. it's a private business and they can correct. tell you what they what you do on their time correct and the minute the owner and the nfl and or the nfl says stop doing that he's got to stop doing that or get out of the nfl which is not really a big step for him no since uh, he's already there <laughs> yeah so. so it's not really a problem yeah uh but i i have to say on the other side I I agree with the president's right of free speech to say the things that he said this weekend, mm-hmm. but he has to remember he is the leader of the free world. He's not a game show host. He's not a talk show host. He's not a, that's not who he is anymore. He's the president and the leader of the free world. And to be saying that people should be fired for having a stance is wrong is just wrong. Yeah. I liked everything else he said about, uh, you know, the the national anthem isn't about race. It's about respect and it love is. for it the is. country. I agree. And he's right about that. He is. Yep. And, uh, you, and you know what? You know what would be great? If he would have said, look, the national anthem, while the NFL is deciding to do whatever they're doing and people decide to disrespect, to me, the national anthem is about our, is about our uh, veterans and what they fought for. And uh, that's why I urge you to spend your Sundays volunteering at a VA center. That would have been a great statement. Can you imagine that? Yeah. If he's encouraging and he said, in fact, I'll be joining you for the next four Sundays. I don't I'm not asking you to boycott. I, I'm asking you to get busy and to stand up for what you really believe in. And what you really believe in is not the flag or the anthem, the song. What you really believe in is what it stands for. And those people who fought for it need our help. I mean, because that would have been powerful, that would be powerful, and it's a yeah. great way to do it. I will say, however, I, I am on Trump's side, generally speaking, on this issue. Right? Me too. I mean, I, there are parts of his statements that I didn't like, but obviously, yeah. I'm on his side. When the uninvited thing up. was just childish. Yeah, but I'm, I am up for the standing for the national anthem. I'm there. The issue I have, though, is I just don't want the president involved in it. I don't want. Mm-hmm. I don't want any of that there. It's so frustrating. The NFLPA came out with a statement. Was like, you should never have to take a job. In which um, you you uh, lose your rights, like it, same thing. They can't. They'll lose their First Amendment rights if someone stops them from kneeling. First of all, where is this take when it comes to every bakery that doesn't <laughs> yeah. want to make a, a, a <laughs> cake mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I on, thought, religious on religious yes, grounds? On religious grounds, grounds. They, they absolutely are fine with it there. Yes, but yeah. I just don't want. Now this has become an arena of politics. There, I, I don't understand it, and I, I keep coming back to this, which is like this feeling that. Yeah, I could I could bail on the NFL because I don't like what's going on right now. I could see that, and a mm-hmm. lot of people are. But it's like then Colin Kaepernick has done something that has taken something you love away from you. Yeah, yeah. are you gonna give Colin Kaepernick or Donald Trump the power to take something that you love away from you? I do. I will not give them that control of my life. What if we replace the opening of the game? We replace the national anthem with "Let's Get Jiggy with It." To to put together a fund that said. Um, you know, we're going to support the families of fallen cops and we're going to uh, take the same fund and we're going to look for the injustice and, you know, and look for the the corruption in the blue line. And they would have said, we believe that cops want we, we believe that cops want good cops around them and not bad cops. And they would have done something that would have. Uh, allowed the players to say, hey, there's a real problem in with some police forces. Okay, I'm I'm with you on that. Let's go find the bad cops. I'm yeah. 100% with you on that. So are a lot of police officers. Yes, yeah, most police officers are. Um, and if they would have just said, hey, we support our cops, but we support justice. And we want to make sure that the cops are clean. And they would have just... I don't know, come up with some fund or something that would have been able to highlight that or just do PSAs during the NFL 
that holds up cops and takes down bad cops and and did it in a broad brush instead of what happened in St. Louis this week. No, no, no. Let's let's look at the broad brush. So you don't piss anybody off. They could have so easily have done that. And I would support an organization like that if it was committed to also in a controversial case coming out and saying, you know what, the police officer was right in this one. Yes. Because I you need both sides of that. It you can't have to. just be let's go find bad cops. Mm-mm. It's got to also be, hey, uh, so I, uh, this is a thing that made a lot of noise, and maybe there are athletes and, and celebrities tweeting about it, but they were wrong in this case. Mm-hmm, if mm-hmm. I could get that organization, I'd be really pleased with it. And I think, you know, it's certainly what we you have try the to do mon- when we handle it. But you, you have the money of the NFL. You could figure that out. And all of this problem would have been solved, and, they, and the NFL would have looked like they were uniting people instead of dividing people, and they could have played football. And I think, honestly, what they did here is just they just punted on this issue. They just hoped it would go away, and I think it was and on it, that path. It would have. It would have. Um, but now it's a political issue, and we'll probably never see the end of yeah. it. Yeah, because now it's really not even about Black Lives Matter or the cops or no. anything else. Now it's all about Donald Trump. Yeah, now it's all about do you like Trump or not. That's yeah. why you saw uh, about 10 times as many people yep. sitting down this week than before. It wasn't about the Black Lives Matter cause. Okay, we're going to continue our conversation about 15 on Facebook. 